I want to keep this very informal. Um, it was something I thought about because I worked in psychiatry for 40 years. I'm a nurse for 42 years, by the way. I've been in psychiatry for 40 years. Of course, I started when I was three. <laughs> it's very young, um, but here I am. Um, I have been here in San Diego for close to 30 years. I work right now at Scripps Mercy Hospital, and I have for 18 years. I've also worked at Sharp Mesa Vista. I've also worked at San Diego County Site Hospital. And um, it's also a very small psychiatric nursing community. So I pretty much know most of the hospitals in town. And I've either visited them or um, have colleagues there. I'm also a surveyor, a psychiatric um, hospital surveyor for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. So what that means, it's the FEDS, it's CMS. And what we do is we go to hospitals all across the country um, and we, we're essentially surveying for good care. We look for patient rights issues and treatment planning issues and things like that. Um, and I thought it might be valuable for um, folks to have kind of what I call a heads up. Um, what would it be like to have to be admitted to a psychiatric hospital and what happens when you get there? I hope nobody has to, by the way. And I also would like to say that some of you may have experiences in some of them. I am not either a 0% person or 100% person. Hospitals are very different, just like people are very, very different. And people's personal experience is very different as well. So I'm happy to field questions for you, but you know, I really won't be able to get into personal nuances about experiences that many of you have. And the other thing is, I'm going to give you the perspective from the staff. This is not the patient perspective. So keep that in mind. I want you to kind of have a sense. Um, uh, and certainly in a setting like this, you can really ask me anything about any hospital. And I'm, not, I'm also not going to compare hospitals, which one's better than the other, because um, they all have pluses and minuses to them. But I can share some of the nuances about some of them if you care to. So I'm going to roll through. This is my little cheat sheet. I do a lot of presentations, by the way. They're usually much more formal and with PowerPoint. And I started to think about doing that. But I don't think that would be the most comfortable way to go. So if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to kind of rattle off the way it usually is for a patient to come into a psychiatric hospital, um, uh, whether it's a first time or a repeat time. I'll talk about a number of issues that I think are important. And then I'd really yeah. like to hear your questions. Um, and I'm here to field those for you as well. OK, sounds like a plan for us? OK, great. So admission process. First, first thing to think about is there are um, people can become admitted either voluntarily, they come on their, of, of their own volition, or in involuntary status. Let's talk about voluntary first. You want to be in a hospital, you need to be in a hospital, and you and your physician have decided that you need to be in a hospital, or your loved one. Uh, clearly, there are families here as well. Um, there, there are options for a physician to simply admit you directly to the hospital. Um, some hospitals will require that you go to an emergency room first. Mostly that's because they want to have you what's called medically cleared. They want to make sure before you're on a psychiatric unit, which has psychiatrically sophisticated staff, but that staff are not necessarily as sophisticated as uh, medical staff. Yeah. So they want to make sure that you're medically clear. Also, different nuances between some units. A unit like the Scripps Mercy unit is a unit within a general hospital. So if somebody becomes sick, medically sick on that unit, we have very easy access to send the patient to a medical floor, to the emergency room, or to have a medical physician come to that unit. That's different from a unit like uh, San Diego County, Aurora, um, uh, Alvarado Parkway Institute, or Sharp Mesa Vista. Those are freestanding facilities. And they don't have as easy access to medical care. They have some. So they, they clearly would want to know that you have medical clearance, that you're stable enough from that perspective. So that's the, um, that's the voluntary way to be admitted. Um, you can also volunteer yourself without a physician. You'd probably have to do that through the emergency room. Or some other hospitals have an admission area where you can just walk in and say, I need to be admitted, and you'll then be assessed for that admission. Questions about voluntary status? OK, yeah? What are some medical conditions that would prevent them from going? Like, to, in order to gain medical clearance, or 
Yeah, well, well good question. Have. Well, we don't want anybody who's uh, uh, bleeding uh, or has an acute uh, cardiac problem. There are many things that we can manage, but we can't manage things that will need equipment. Um, so we don't want intravenous lines, right? We don't want people who need to have uh, IV infusions on those on the unit. Um, it, it, it's pretty. There's really a, a, a wide range that we can manage. Um, it's the acute medical problems that will that would be more difficult for us. Sometimes someone can go and get that stabilized for a day or two, and then come to the psychiatric unit. That's possible as well. Um, the things that we do manage pretty easily because it's pretty common for people who also have psychiatric disorders nowadays or metabolic problems, sugar problems, diabetes, it's pretty prevalent. Um, we also manage respiratory problems because uh, there's a lot of chronic respiratory issues. So, you know, there are those kinds of things that we can handle. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about in Yes? Do you take the psych evaluation before admitting them or you just admit them according to what they just tell you? Well, what they're just telling us would be part of, this, of the admission process, yes. It, it's part of the psychiatric assessment, if that's what you're asking. Are you talking about voluntary? Yeah, voluntary. Well, the patient presents as though they need an admission. We don't admit. It, it, no hospital will admit without doing a full assessment first. Yeah. Um, and if you are volunteering to come into a hospital and you don't have a physician, you'll need to have a physician. So a physician will have to be assigned to you um, and see you. Some facilities have admission people who are not physicians. Um, they're usually masters prepared, psychologists, could be uh, advanced practice nurses, um, and they may do the assessment. They will oftentimes need um, an acceptance from a physician. If the physician can't see the person at the time, um, they can do that by telephone. The clinician will tell the psychiatrist what they're seeing in the patient and that the patient wants to be admitted. The therapist agrees with that. The psychiatrist will oftentimes say yes, admit them under my service, and then he, will, he or she will do a full workup. Okay. Now there's the involuntary way. That's oftentimes it's because of a crisis. Um, and by the way, there are um, few, really very few reasons that someone um, will be admitted uh, uh, involuntarily. Uh, in order to do that, one needs to be a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or have what's called a grave disability by virtue of a psychiatric disorder. That grave disability is a little tricky. Danger to self, danger to others is usually pretty clear. It's pretty overt for most folks. Um, the grave disability is sometimes a, a, a bit of a gray issue. Uh, and it essentially means that the person cannot provide food, clothing, or shelter for themselves by virtue of a psychiatric illness. Okay? So if someone is homeless, living on the street, and they can say that they live in this cardboard box behind McDonald's and they get their meal through the trash, they're not necessarily considered greatly disabled because they're able to provide food and shelter for themselves. So there's no, it sounds a little odd, but that's their version of, of food and shelter, yeah. No. So this, there's a lot of, a lot of areas in, in this that have some deviations in terms of interpretation. From what folks. about if a person does have a place to live and let's say they're a cutter or their um, uh, medication is wrong? until the DNA portion starts where they can take your DNA and know which medications you should be on or shouldn't for all okay. the disorders. And they want to be admitted? No. No. Um, they don't want to be admitted. Right. Well, then they... It, it, if they take you anyway. Um, well, it, it, okay, if somebody takes a person to a hospital and admits that person and the, and the patient is disagreeing, the hospital has the right to assess the patient for 72 hours, something called a 72 hour hold. We can keep someone for 72 hours while we're doing an assessment. 
Um, at the end of 72 hours, if we feel as though the person is still not able to leave the hospital, the person does believe they can, we can go to the court and ask the court for an extension of two weeks, 14 days. So that's kind of a total of 17 days that oftentimes the court will say yes, sometimes they'll say no, they'll come in and they'll talk to the patient. Um, but if they do say yes, then the hospital can keep the person for 17 days while they're doing this assessment and work up. Work up. The, the, the typical scenario, I'll tell you what usually happens, is within the first 72 hours, if the patient allows us to treat them, they start to get better and they oftentimes voluntarily agree to stay. And then that legal hold is up and they stay voluntarily. That's the typical scenario. Okay, we understand that uh, you know when someone is in crisis, they're not necessarily behaving or thinking the way they usually do. Um, and oftentimes, we can help them to figure that out after those 72 hours. So that's kind of the, the how someone gets admitted. Yes, sir? So what about uh, somebody who is using substance, stuff like alcohol, smoking, so about to, in time when we try to talk to that person, they still in denial. And yet you see that they, these stuff are not really helping that person. Well, we probably cannot admit someone involuntarily unless they're a danger to themselves, danger to others, or have grave disability. Okay? So it doesn't mean that we can automatically admit. It, it, it's the burden of the hospital and the physicians to, to come up with that assessment of, of one of those three, um, one of those three legal areas in order to admit involuntarily. Does that mean that if you're drinking and can't really take you because you can't, you're not in your right mind in the first place? Different hospitals do different things. Um, oftentimes, if someone is um, under the influence of alcohol or another substance, they'll probably have a stay in the emergency room until, until the substance is out of their system, they clear up and we can see them. People are very, very different when they're under the, under the influence and about 12 hours later. So oftentimes we do not admit, but we wait. They just keep talking. Yeah, right. Okay, so that's how somebody gets into the hospital. So you got admitted now, okay? Or your loved one is admitted voluntarily or involuntarily. That status in most hospitals is not necessarily known by anyone else other than you and the staff. The other patients don't know that you're voluntary, you're involuntary, you're voluntary, involuntary. There's, there's no, you, no labels, nobody wears a cap, nobody wears a shirt that says what you are. So everyone's just there together. Um, the, the next thing that winds up happening is a lot of paperwork. And one of the things that I need to share with all of you is be a good consumer of healthcare. Read the documents that are being put in front of you. You're going to be signing an awful lot of things. Okay? It's a lot of acceptance of admission, rules and regulations of these units. Um, uh, it's, really, it's really important. Now, if you can't at the moment, and you do need to sign it voluntarily into the hospital, um, then do that. And the next day, whenever you're feeling better or more comfortable, ask to see those papers that you signed. So you have a right to do that, okay? So very important to know that, a lot of paperwork. You're also gonna be faced with a lot of different people who are gonna do assessments, and many of the questions are gonna be redundant. That's very, very disturbing to many patients. The reasoning for that, though, is the different clinicians are looking for different things. And by different clinicians, I mean you're being seen by nurses, you're being seen by a social worker. has a whole different, a whole different area that they're thinking about. they will be seen by a physician as well. Many of us, though, will ask the same kinds of questions. So important to kind of hang tight. And, and you know, some people are, get really unhappy that I answered that already. Yes, but the cl each clinician wants to hear you tell us the story. I don't really want to count on what my other clinician colleague has heard, at least initially, okay? because you're, you're new to us. So that's important to know. Physical, yeah? Um, so, I know there's a lot of documents, and, um, but what if the person doesn't, like, is there a way to stay anonymous? Or, like, if you have to be <clears throat> anonymous? You mean? That's a good question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rephrase that a little bit. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Almost, I'm going to change that. All psychiatric units have a high degree of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. You can't come in anonymously, though. I mean, we have to know who you are. Um, but there's a higher degree of confidentiality in those units. I'll give you some examples. We have a lot of electronic medical records now, yes, in, in most of the hospitals. Um, I can tell you that at Scripps Mercy Hospital, the electronic medical record for the patients on the psychiatric unit are not able to be seen by the staff on medical units. Okay, so, so there, are, there are usually insurances. Um, there is the possibility uh, for someone who is, uh, lack of a better term, famous, We've had that, yeah, a VIP. They can come in anonymously. We give them a pseudonym, uh, and we have to manage the press, and that does happen. Uh, but that's that's really much more of a bigger public issue. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, physical assessment. You are going to be asked to, in a, one way, shape, or form or another, be seen without your clothes on by a nurse. Uh, that pretty much almost always happens. Um, some of that, some of the reason for that is we want to see if you have any marks or scars in your bodies, if you have any wounds that you've not told us about. Um, we really need to know those kinds of things up front. So not any difficult, different from checking into the emergency room or going to see a medical person, someone's going to want to see you naked. So just <laughs> you've got to kind of be prepared for that. Uh, we need to see all those things. Property and safekeeping, very important. Now. Nowadays, we have the world of electronics. Your cell phone is going to be taken away from you. I have to tell you that. So that becomes a big issue, and we understand that, because we all have our telephone directories on, on those phones. So most of the hospital staff will say to you, take the numbers that you want off the phone, and they're going to lock up that phone. Why? Why do we do that? Well, first of all, there's cameras in those phones, talking about confidentiality. Um, we really need to manage all of the patients on the unit. So it's, uh, I, have to, I have to ensure that I can pr protect the other patients from having one patient, even, even in a fun way, taking a picture of, of that patient, even if it's kind of accidental. So those phones are taken, taken away. Also, anything of value. We do not want you to have anything valuable on those units. Thefts occur. Uh, it is, you know, it's sad to say, but it, it just is true. Uh, and so we really want to protect your property. Most facilities will have uh, either a bin or a storage unit on, the, on uh, a place on the unit where you can go for some of your things, but things that are valuable, don't bring in a lot of cash, don't bring in your diamond ring, don't wear your Rolex. You, know, you don't want any of that stuff. That kind of stuff probably goes to a secured place, like security in the hospital. We'll probably have a vault where they'll leave something like that. Doesn't mean it's impossible for you to get in and out of, but for the most part, it's not It's not great for you to keep those things is on that, the unit. I'm sorry, isn't that the reasoning why when they the uh, fire department or the police department or when they pick you up, they kind of um, leave everything except your keys? You mean they want you to leave things where you are? No, they, they don't want me to have anything but my keys because I'm going into the psychiatric. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really your protection to not bring those things with you. Okay, that's property safekeeping. Unit orientation. You should be able to expect to have some kind of orientation to the unit that you're on. Sometimes that's done by staff. Sometimes that's done by a patient greeter who will take you around and kind of show you the ropes. Um, shift, shift, I'm going to call a shift milieu the sense of the shifts. Um, most hospitals have three shifts, days, PMs, and nights. Yeah, And they're different from each other. The tone, the mood, the activities are very, very different. Day shift tends to be the busiest. It has the most. Um, as the most people coming and going, you'll have lab technicians coming and going, you'll have a fair amount of activities happening, um, your physicians are there, the management of the unit is there, so that there's just a lot of different folks around. PMs, it starts getting quieter, it tends to have, be the visiting time. 
Um, and then night shift, of course, is the quietest time. Um, during all of those shifts, though, there are always observations happening. So some staff member is assigned to, typically nowadays, most hospitals have what's called 15-minute checks. Every 15 minutes, you're observed, whether you know it or not. People walking around with clipboards, people watching where you are, uh, they know that you're either in a group, um, they know that you're in the room, they know that you're in the dining room, or they know that you're missing, and they're going to come and try to find you if you're someplace else on the unit, okay, if the units are, are big. There are units that are what, what's called open units. So Sharp Mesa Vista Hospital, for instance, has two units that are open units. Um, they're chemical dependency unit and they have one other unit. Um, I think it's their East Wing 2 unit upstairs. Those patients can walk around the hospital. So they come out of that unit and they go to the regular cafeteria and dining room. So at Tri City Hospital, they have the closed unit and then and a, and you open feel unit. you need to stay longer, then you can go, go to a locked unit. Many, many places have that. Okay, so, um, so people can walk around. I mentioned that in terms of observation, somebody's still coming to try to find you in case you're not, not on the unit or where, you, where we think you are. Who's the staff on these units? Well, you have nurses, you have registered nurses in most of the hospitals, or all of the hospitals have to have registered nurses. Some of the hospitals have licensed vocational um, nurses. Um, some have gone away with that and we don't have LVNs anymore. There's a group of staff members in California called licensed psychiatric technicians. They are, they have been trained for a year like a licensed vocational nurse, but only in psychiatry. And they pretty much um, pass medications. They pretty much know a fair amount about psychiatric medications and that's their role. We have occupational therapists, we have activity therapists. You, everyone should have a social worker, uh, social workers, talking about discharge planning right from day one. Uh, if there's problems, complications. Social workers in some hospitals, depending on how many social workers there are and what their caseload is and what the expectation is, will also do family counseling, joint, joint uh, couple counseling. Um, some hospitals have that, some don't. You know, it depends, you need to know the role of your social worker and what they're able to do or not. What is the difference of staff for nights and weekends? Um, it, there shouldn't be any difference. Well, you're not necessarily going to see a social worker. That's going to depend on a hospital. Some hospitals do have one for the weekend. Um, you'll always have registered nurses. You'll always have mental health workers. Um, you, once again, I said you may have a social worker or not. You'll see. Your, you'll usually see your psychiatrist will come in during on the weekend. Um, uh, you may or may not have the same activity therapist or occupational therapist. It really depends on the hospital and how many they have. Some will cover other units, some will cover weekends. So it's possible or not. I will say that in many hospitals, weekends are really boring because there's not a lot going on. But staffing in California, nurse staffing in California, by the way, which has nothing to do with psychiatry, um, uh, we follow what's called um, safe staffing ratios. So there's oftentimes a number of patients, a number of nurses that need to be there. Okay? Nowadays, by the way, a lot of staff on these units all wear the same kind of uniform so you don't have a clue as to who you're talking to. So ask. You need to ask. Almost all places will assign a patient to what's called a contact person. There'll be some staff member that is your contact person for the day. That really is just a person, your go-to person. They're not necessarily your nurse. So if you need medication, if you're needing extra medication, you're having some symptom that you want your nurse to know about, you go to your contact person and they say, oh, no, I need to get your nurse. That's why your nurse is not your contact person for the day. But nurses can be contact people, yes. Do we have site techs here in San Diego? Yeah. Licensed psychiatric technicians. Yeah, some hospitals have them. They're they're well, California. Uh, they're legal in California. All states don't have them, but California does. So and yes, we do have some San Diego. Okay, so that's shift change and observations and staff. Um, any questions about staff? 
Okay, treatment team. We'll talk about the treatment team. So all of these people are part of your treatment team. You should have a nurse, you should have a social worker, you should be a physician, okay? And, on, and, and there are regulations which um, uh, encourage, force or encourage, um, the treatment team to meet at least once a week about you. And you should be allowed to participate in your treatment team. Some hospitals do that routinely. Many hospitals do. Routinely have the patient join the treatment team for a short meeting to talk about how things are going and some of the different staff members, the social worker will have a different way of thinking, the nurse will have a little different way of thinking, um, and you can participate. If you're not invited to your treatment team, if the hospital doesn't do that routinely, but you really want to, I would say ask. Uh, they may say fine. So some hospitals do it routinely, some hospitals do not. But you, you, your situation is talked about, is discussed among the team, at least weekly. What's your perspective on psychiatric advance directives? That's a great question. Um, you know, they, they started about, what, eight, nine, ten years ago or so. They haven't taken off well. Um, I think they need to be done before the patient comes to the inpatient setting, um, when they're feeling well enough to be able to go through all of those. Um, if you have one, you need to bring it to the hospital and let them know that you do have one. Uh, a, a psychiatric advance directive, as well as any advance directive, will always have a little bit of a, um, a carve out of in an emergency. So we do understand that. Uh, but I think they're excellent to have. And there are some that you can pull up online. I think one state, I want to say Minneapolis. Where's Minneapolis? That's the city. Minnesota. I think the state of Minnesota has a, almost a rule that all patients who come into a psychiatric hospital have to have a psychiatric advance directive. Oftentimes, that, though, that's done as an outpatient before they come in as an inpatient. I'm sorry, can you explain what, what that is? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, what okay. That's psychiatric advance, advanced directive for health care. Um, I hope you all have one for your own medical care. Yes, I want this at end of life. No, I don't want that. Yeah. Um, so you can set one up for your psychiatric care. No, I don't want ECT. I have had an a, a allergic reaction to this. I don't want that, et cetera, et cetera. So you can drive that. If you have one of those, bring it with you to the hospital and show it at the front end. You should also be asked if you have one. And oftentimes you will. Can you write one yourself? You can. There's. It, it's usually a formal. It's a formal document. But once again, Google them. You'll find one. I'm sure you can pull one up and you fill it in. If you don't have, if you don't have a computer, go to the library. You can find um, one in the library. Or just ask my social worker. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They can get it for you. So what if I go and find like I don't need to be restrained? Uh huh. That can I can go with. You can say that. Yes. Once again, there's always a carve out for an emergency, yes. Um, but, but I would put those things down. Oftentimes we'll be asked about issues um, related to restraints too, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so that's treatment team. Program schedule. Program schedules are different on every unit. Um, and, and even uh, in hospitals that have multi-units, so let's talk about some of the differences. Sharp Mesa Vista, for instance, they have a unit for children, yeah, only children and adolescents. They have the uh, senior unit, geriatric people, over the age of 65. Um, they have a unit just for chemical dependency. They have other just general adult units. I'm mentioning that only because the programming, the kinds of activities on each of those units will be different from each other. So keep that in mind, and you should ask about the program schedule, and you will be encouraged to participate in the program. Um, for the most part, the opinions of the staff are that if you're here, you should take advantage of everything that we have. Just because you don't like one group doesn't mean you won't necessarily like another one. And oftentimes, my experience is that the patients get a lot out of talking to the other patients. Um, and I think that that's really important. But sometimes you can, you have an, sometimes you have options of picking and choosing. You can go to this group or that group, um, so you can make that decision. I don't think we have anything in San Diego that's similar to some hospitals across the country have something called a program mall. 
um, which is a really nice setup where you can essentially walk down the hallway and each of the rooms has a different program going on. And there's a little sign outside that says this is what this group is and you can kind of write your own ticket and choose where you want to go. But I don't know of any of the San Diego hospitals that have that. Um, okay, visiting. Visiting times are usually um, strict or restricted. Why? Everybody wants to know why. We don't really want to. It's not that we're restricting visitors. It's the idea that we really want you to be in program. And so sometimes if visitors are coming in all in and out, then um, you're going to want to see a loved one as opposed to being in that group that day. Now I'm going to give you some exceptions that can always be made. Um, if you have a loved one who it can't drive at night, you can get permission to have special visiting privileges. The person who's going to do that is going to be the physician. So the physician can write a special order. He's going to also talk to the team, though, the treatment team, about doing that. Um, because if we're going to say that the person can have visitors 724 all the time, and that's all they're doing and not going to program, the question comes up as to, well, why are they still in the hospital? Okay, if they can, if they can just see their doctor um, and not do anything else that the hospital has to offer, then maybe they don't need to be in the hospital. Yeah, makes sense a little bit. Okay, so that's some of the reasons for that. Length of stay. How long is the length of stay? Well, that's that's really, it's really very different. Um, it's different for every person in terms of, of their illness and their acute situation. Um, sometimes it's unfortunately driven by your insurance. Uh, I have to say that because it's kind of your bill. Uh, so if you have an insurance that will pay for just seven days of inpatient stay, it probably behooves you to not stay more than that if that's a possibility. Because uh, no one's, no one's going to pay for that. Um, can the psychiatrist uh, change that because of maybe the medication? Well, the psychiatrist can change the length of stay, but he can't change your insurance. Um, so that, and so you have to work together on, on where we can get, um, how stable you can get as an inpatient and then continue as an outpatient if needed. And by the way, there are different levels of outpatient, which is not part of what I'm talking about yet, but if we have time, I can get into that. You, when you leave an inpatient unit, you don't only have to have a physician in an office. There are outpatient programs that you can go to that are similar. Okay, just you just go home and sleep at night. Um, discharge. Discharge planning is done right at the beginning. Once you get started, we want to know: Are you going to need discharge? Are you going to go home to someplace safe? Um, do you have loved ones at home that are going to care for you? Um, do you live alone, and is that going to be okay? So all of that kind of gets started right from the beginning. Um, and there will be a, a fair amount, remember the paperwork I mentioned at the front end? There's gonna be a lot of that paperwork at the back end as well. A lot of different clinicians are gonna to wanna to be checking in with you now to make sure that it's safe for you to go home and that you've got a good plan um, and that you have an emergency plan in case, in, in case some things fall apart, that you have medications if you need them, um, that you can get them that you have enough supply until the next step in whatever your treatment is going to be, whether that's an outpatient, whether that's going back to your physician, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So that's important. Um, I already mentioned a little bit about medical problems. So most hospitals are going to have you seen by a medical physician. Uh, and that medical physician, or maybe some places might have a nurse practitioner, they're going to do a, a, a physical um, assessment of you um, and make recommendations. If you have things, medical things that can be treated in this hospital during this time, then good chance that will happen as well. That's certainly a possibility. Or there'll be recommendations for medical follow-up. Okay. Um, then there's diet issues. If you have dietary concerns, you need to mention them, and almost all patients will be seen by a dietitian and can have a special diet set up. Generally, we all know hospital food is really crappy, right? Nobody likes hospital food. Um, we do tend, most hospitals, I don't want to say we in any, but many hospitals will do not encourage outside food. Some of that is because we can't, we can't assure the safety of that food on the unit, um, so we try to shy away from that. If, however, for some 
um, religious reason, for some cultural reason, um, for some other extraneous reason. Um, just you just have a person who only will eat such and such from such and such, and that's the only place we can get it. Once again, your physician is the ticket to making a special privilege. Okay, and 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 again, he or she is going to check in with the staff to make sure that that's okay. Nobody wants to make an independent decision. It's really a team decision. So there's a number of folks who get get involved in that kind of decision making. But diet is definitely part of it. Your medical record. <clears throat> there is a medical record about you. Um, sometimes it's electronic. Sometimes it's paper. Some of the, some facilities have both. You do have the right to see your medical record. Usually, that right happens after you leave the hospital. If you insist on seeing something while you're in the hospital, you need to do that with your physician. So it's not going to be an automatic. If you go approach a nurse or, or your contact person for the day and see, say, I'd like to see what's written about me, they're not going to be able to show that to you. Again, if you really want to see it for some specific reason, you're probably going to need to go through your physician and be asked. Uh, and, and he or she will probably sit with you to talk to you about what is being said. Yeah. Um, is it also that you have to ask after you've left the hospital and everything, um, you can ask for your medical records mm -hmm. and the pictures, for instance, of mm -hmm. certain things. Absolutely. Happen, and they have to sure. give it to you. Sure. Yeah, that's pretty easy. You tend to go to medical records in most of these hospitals and make that so request. They yeah, they'll all do that. Also, if you go to another hospital, okay, so let's say uh, eight years ago you were admitted to Tri-City Hospital and you d did great all these years. Now you're having a little bit of a setback and you get admitted to San Diego County Psych Hospital. They're going to ask you to release those records from the first hospital. It's really important that you do that. We want to see what helped last time. Because if we know that, we can move a little bit faster. Uh, so the faster we get those records, the, the better off we are. Okay? So if you know that, that's good. Okay, um, that was pretty much the, the formal part. I have a bunch of little loose things. My husband's a psychiatrist, so he and I talked about this. And I, I said, what other things would you think to add? So a couple of things that he mentioned I think are good, good points. Service animals. Um, some of you have service animals. Many of our patients have service animals that they want to bring with them. Um, the Disabilities Act says that we must have those. I will tell you, though, it's problematic for us. So I, 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 I'm just sharing that because you may get a little bit of resistance. And some of the issues are issues that you may not be thinking about. But if you're on a locked unit, who's going to walk the dog? Yeah. <laughs> it's a problem. Uh, you know, we can't have we can't have staff be responsible for walking the dog. We can't let you out to walk the dog. Um, some places have people who you know they, they ensure that the dog will get walked. The other issue is other patients, um, other patients who may have fears of these animals, or other patients who may um, have an allergic reaction to these animals. So, it, 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 I'm not telling you you can't. I'm just saying it's probably not going to be smooth sailing. Good chance when you ask, you're going to get a frowning face um, because because it's just going to be a problem for us. It's not necessarily we're going to say no. We've definitely had them, um, but it's it becomes a little bit much for us to manage. But it is doable. So service animals. Another uh, another issue is sex on the unit. No, 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 and no. <laughs> it's not that you're not all grown ups. It's you know on a, on, a, on all the adult units. Um, but the issue is it's our responsibility to protect all the patients. I can't guarantee that this other patient is really consenting. No matter what you all say, it's okay, we get it. Um, but it's just, it's going to be shied upon. It's a big problem for us if that happens. Now there are, by the way, long-term locked facilities. Alpine, I don't know if you've heard about that place that's here in the San Diego area. That's a long-term lock facility. Sex is allowed there. That's it's kind of the way it is. It's, it's a different kind of facility. It's not an acute care hospital. Okay? Um, so keep that one in mind. Sex, no, no. Here's your other no, no. Please don't bring in your substances. Your substances are going to get found. 
Um, if you try to sneak them in, we're probably going to find them. We're going to give you a frowny face again about that. Um, we need to know what you're taking. You get a lot of different medications in these facilities, a lot of different combinations of things. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about bringing in illegal substances, okay? Um, and many people do that, and I, I, I'm not making a, a, any kind of a, a chastisement on what people do on the outside. I'm just telling you on the inside, um, when the door is locked, we really don't want any of those. Also, it's a worry that another patient will, will get those. Uh, it's a worry that you may be really casual about it for yourself, and you may share it with someone else. It becomes a problem for us. So illegal substances are definitely a no-no. Now, your question, own medications. You may bring in your own medications. They are not going to be allowed to be left at your bedside. I would encourage you to bring your medications and give them up to your nurse so that we know we're going to log in what it is that you're taking. Um, if you're taking, uh, let's talk about not just prescribed medicines, because those, those are pretty easy. We'll wind up just prescribing them for you. Um, but um, herbals or over-the-counter things, vitamins, things that may be very important to you, that's okay. Bring those, give those to us. The physician will look them over. Um, perhaps a pharmacist. I didn't mention pharmacists. Many places have a psychiatric pharmacist that, that work particularly on their unit or in the hospital. They're, they're an excellent resource. Um, some of the issue of why we won't want you to continue is if the physician is changing your medications right now, um, there are over-the-counter meds, um, alternative medications that are wonderful. People like St. John's Ward, people like a, a few others, but they do have combinations with some of, these, some of the medical meds. So we really need to know what all of those are. So it's not quite as easy to just take your own, okay? But do bring them in so that we know what they are. We know that they're important to you, and if, if, if you can, we'll just let you take them. You sometimes, if we don't have them, but we think it's okay for you to take them, you, um, it'll be sent up to the pharmacy, it'll be looked at and checked out to make sure that's what it is, relabeled and sent back down to you, and then you can take them. As vitamins, you can bring in them. You can bring, but you gotta give them up. You can't just right. bring them, not tell us, and put them in your drawer. We need to know what, because we really need to know what they are. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're on like nine different ones, that would take Yeah, some people are on 25 of them, plus their own medications, so a lot of pills sitting there. So <laughs> we really want to know what all of those are, because you're going to be given other ones. Right. Smoking. Almost all hospitals have now gone smoke free that I know of. Let's see, who's not still? I think Aurora is still a smoking hospital. It's Tri-City, I don't think Tri-City anymore. Most, most are no longer. Um, if you are a heavy smoker, um, that becomes clearly a, a problem. Tell us, tell us up front, and more often than not, most hospitals have a protocol where fairly quickly you'll be given a nicotine patch to manage, manage um, your craving while you're on the unit, okay? But most units are now smoke free. Um, and lastly, but it actually should have been a little ahead of time, a little ahead of this list, is there are patient advocates um, in, in the county, and they're excellent. Uh, and there are signs up on all of your units, because it, there must be, there's a regulation that there are signs that have the phone number, and you have free access to calling the patient advocate if you think your care is not the way you want it to be. Okay, so you can make that complaint patient advocate will come and talk to you. They'll come and talk to the staff and try to work something out. So that's all that's on my list. So what am I forgetting? What else do you want to know? Yep. Um, is there usually a spot for a psychologist on the staff? I know you mentioned nurses, social workers, great, psychiatrists. Great question. Yes, we would love them. Um, the cost of health care, I'm just going to tell you the way it is. The cost of health care over all these years really precludes most hospitals from having psychologists. Um, however, that being said, many contract out. So if, so if a patient needs something called psychological testing, if we're not really sure what the diagnosis, what the per person's diagnosis is, um, uh, we may get a consult to come in to do that kind of psychological testing. Um, I think Sharp Mesa Vista has a psych does have a psychologist on each of their units, or 
a few left on some of their units, and I think that they have a psychology intern program, so there might be psychology students who are running groups. Um, but for the most part, we don't see too many psychologists on admission units anymore. We used to. Remember I told you I'm 40 years in this business. I have to tell you, we used to have longer lengths of stay, multiple staff members, uh, a lot more services than we have now, which is pretty sad. Just maybe back off of that, is there a group therapy offered? Who runs those? Great question. Could be nurses, could be um, activity, Therapists, occupational therapists, all usually are trained. Um, could be some hospitals have, um, everyone calls them different, mental health worker, mental health technician. Some are have bachelor's degrees and have some training. Some are internally trained within the hospital and doing group therapy. Um, I mentioned social workers, social workers will as well. So a number of different people that do groups. And, Group therapy happens a lot. Yeah, go ahead. Um, my original question was, if you're over 18, like how much does your family legally get to know about your treatment? Nothing. But then is it is like a form you have to oh, the, the, Your family will know whatever you want them to know. So you can, you can sign off and say, yeah, tell them everything. Or you can come into the hospital and say, I don't want them to know I'm here. And we won't tell them. To you. Okay. you make that decision. So if um, mom says it's me and dad says it's me, but you say it's mom, it's mom. You're in charge. Okay. So you have to make that decision. Yeah. I have a question which is tangential, but you brought it up. So in this day and age, why is hospital food still so bad? That is a great question. <laughs> this, this might or might not have to do with your presentation. Uh, but is it a matter of cost? And, uh, what, I, <clears throat> what I'm saying is that even yesterday in the New York Times, they talked about how food in high schools has improved uh, quite a bit, obesity rates have begun to go down, uh, and the cost problem must be this, a similar kind of problem for an institution. Why? Uh, uh, I'll, try, I'll try to answer that, although we probably need the dietary people to tell you. Um, and by the way, it's gotten, it's gotten a little bit better, too. Some of it is industrial food. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of mass marketed. The other is um, you can't season it up. You know, I mean, I, I love going to Indian food or Thai food, but someone else can't tolerate that. Um, so you, you have to, um, I guess, produce the food for the masses. Except you get a menu every Yes, day. and you can choose. That's right. You do get a menu. You get to pick. Plasma transfusion for 12 days, and at Tri City, they have the best food. They have they salmon, do. apple, pork chops. Glad you know. to hear it. Right, yes. right. Yeah, you can. <laughs> so, so it's maybe not so terrible. <laughs> maybe this change. As I said, it's a tangential question. Is that of, in, of interest for anybody who has to go into a hospital for any reason? Because it's important. It is important. It's it is important. It can contribute, I, I imagine, to one of the illnesses. Sure. Sure. If you're not happy with, what I always say is if you're not happy with, go talk to the dietitian because they can set up a special menu for you. And then you can say, I want all the hot red peppers coming up to my, my tray, uh, even at breakfast, and see what you get. By the way, that reminds me, uh, most of the hospitals now will not have caffeine coffee for you. Uh, they, yeah, yeah, they kind of do the decaf thing because caffeine contributes to an interaction with some of the medication. So if you really, really need your caffeine, once again, your doctor is your ticket for that. He's got a right, he or she has the right uh, special privilege for you to have caffeine. And the nurses are gonna, are also gonna tell him because he's gonna ask whether you're sleeping at night. So if you get the special privilege of the coffee and you're up, you're, and, the night, and the night nurse says, you're not sleeping between two and six every night, that coffee's coming away. Well, it's a great question. I'm going to begin by saying, no place is safe. Okay. I, I, 
I say that, no, no place is safe. And that's, that's even true in terms of um, for, for yourself. I mean, there are suicides that have happened probably in every hospital in this county, and most that I know of. Um, it's a tragedy, but it does happen. Um, uh, uh, sometimes in really odd ways. Fights do happen. Patients don't necessarily get along. Okay. That's, that's the no place is safe. However, however, it is the, 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 the marked business of the staff on the unit to keep it as safe as possible. So the staff do know who are the high, high, high risk patients. They do try to keep them separated. Sometimes we will move a patient from one unit to another because they're not getting along. Um, More like an actual p a patient getting so angry. I mean, I see it with one of those chairs that you could barely get up. And he went and threw it at mm -hmm. one of the windows and they put him right away in the locker. Yeah. Well, the, what needs, what, what, first of all, if you're in that kind of situation and something's going on, get out of it. <laughs> yeah. Get, the staff will take care of it. You go the other way. Um, and if you're a little frozen because it happened so fast, good chance the staff member's going to come and take you away. Because that's, that's the role of one staff member to take everybody else out, and we're going to help to uh, help this person to be able to control themselves again. Gentlemen behind you had mentioned the issue of restraints. Since 2000 or 1999, almost all hospitals now are all on uh, an even keel with restraint reduction. We no longer believe that restraints are therapeutic intervention. That was, the, that was a theory many, many years ago. I told you I'm 40 years in psychiatry. I remember a time when we believed that a patient went into restraints and it was calming for them. Nobody believes that anymore. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, it's just not. Um, and almost all facilities, good facilities, work hard at what we call the strength reduction. Um, How do you deal with a person who at one time might have been in restraints and now has no use anymore? Is it uh, by compassion? Staff are much more educated now. We do a lot of de-escalation, a lot of communication. Um, I, I could go on and on about talking about restraints. It's actually one of my areas of interest, and I've been working at restraint reduction for many years. The American Psychiatric Nurse Association has a whole position statement, standards of care to reduce yeah. reduce restraints. Um, how to say no without saying no? No, the staff used to be much more controlling on units. The units used to be control type units. If you came onto a unit, you were told, you can do this, you can't do this, you can do that, you can't do that. And if you messed up, you might find yourself in someone's calling it a lockup, a seclusion room, or a quiet room, or restraints. That kind of philosophy is gone in most hospitals. And if you find yourself in a hospital where it's not gone, and you have your wits about you, you need to get out. It's not a good place. Now, I told you I'm a surveyor across the nation, and I will tell you there are still some snake pits around. I don't think any of that's true for here in San Diego. Um, but you just, you know, I can't say that it's completely gone. But in general, the philosophy of restraining a patient, locking a patient up, not, not needed. We, we no longer do that. Yeah. What do you mean by a snake pit? What do I mean by a snake pit? There was, there was a, a, an old movie called Snake Pit. Um, essentially a really terrible place where patients were abused. Big old state hospitals. There, there used to be quite a few of them. Cooper's Nest would be one of them. But now also most patients are being educated and people know how to handle themselves. Mm -hmm. When they are going to be in crisis, mm -hmm. they know how to turn up. Mm -hmm. They know what not to respond to. You know, like avoid those. You're, okay. you're right. It's a two-way street. Yeah. And we help you to do that. Sometimes when a patient has been educated and maybe slips a little, forgets a little, we just try to remind you. Remember, I just I, the, 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 there's, there's difference in terminology now. Um, we no longer do something called a, a force, a show of force. We do what we call a show of support. We're here to support you to gain control yourself. We're not going to make you. We're not going to control you. Also, um, I wanted to say I've gotten a lot of help from um, an outside
my facility that, that I go to three times a week, and it's a it's um, out of UCSD San Diego, and it's near the hospital, and it's co-occurring um, uh, disorders. Um, they have self-esteem classes. Right, like an outpatient. It's an outpatient. Yeah. Yep. It has nothing to do you. with God or the twelve steps. It has just very, very logical and interesting um, groups, and I've been through a lot. And well, many of our hospitals have outpatient programs. Groups Mercy has an outpatient program. Sharp Mesa Vista has an outpatient program. Right. Um, I have a lot of them do. Yeah. Other questions? I've answered everything for you, everything you wanted to know. Can you refuse medications? Yes, you can. Um, you can refuse medications, and if the facility, if the physician and the facility um, feel as though you are um, refusing medications, but you are still very, very sick and need the medication, um, the facility, the physician, will probably do something called asking for a Reese hearing. It's a legal terminology. Um, where he will petition the court, he or she will petition the court to evaluate you externally. And, the, and a court person comes to the hospital um, and listens to your side and the hospital side about why you're not taking the medication. Um, if you uh, lose the Reese hearing, then we could give you medication against you. But can't do it legally unless we go through that process. Um, and uh, I, I, I would like to think that you can imagine some of the scenarios where somebody is so sick um, and a danger to themselves or others and refusing medication and it's the only thing that's going to help them. Um, and we can't just let them out, we can't let you out uh, because you'd be more of a danger. So we, we have to treat you. Are those considered like schizophrenics? And, and I, it's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get into labeling. It's not just somebody. It's just anybody who has a, a problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you, you also, um, something to think about um, from a staff perspective, uh, why are you in the hospital? You're in the hospital, you don't want to take medications. I mean, I'd like to say that psychiatry has many, 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 many other interventions, but we don't. Yeah, we have medications, we have talk therapies, we have. Uh, uh, electroshock. Um, we have the new transmagnetic um, uh, systems. I mean, there are other things, but we don't have a big arsenal of treatments, uh, and medications is one of them. We, we very much understand the side effects of medications. We know that that is problematic for folks, but we have to ask um, that we can, that we and you consider the risks versus the, the risks and benefits. Can you live, live a functional life without them? If you can, cool. Have you seen that, um, what is it called, trans, the, where they put the- Trans, yeah, the well, magnetic. E um, the magnetic or ECT? No, magnetic. The newer, the newer one? Does it work? Uh, um, you know, I'm hearing mixed reviews about that. Um, I hear some, it's, it's very time consuming and, uh, I think it's uh, a 40 minute treatment five days a week for five to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Think about that. That is a lot. Um, so it's costly and it's your time. Uh, and I, I, what I've heard um, from the, some of the physicians who do it here in town, because we do have a couple who do, and, uh, and I heard one patient talk about it, they do get relief. It's a little on the short term. Yeah, you have to keep doing it. So then you have to keep doing it. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I think it's new enough. I, I, I like new things, but I'm always a wait and seer. You know, I'm, 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 I've worked in this field long enough that I know all the problems with the old medications. And then the new medications came about, and, and you know, people said, oh, these are great, and there's no side effects, and there's no, well, you know, that's not true. It's just a different set of side effects. Um, we took away one group and we have another group, so um, so my personal opinion is I'm waiting to see. Um, 
Uh, I know the Mayo Clinic, I visited the Mayo Clinic, and, and, and they're doing it. And, uh, but once again, they, they see exactly what I'm saying so far. Yep. How many patients would a physician have, and then like, how many physicians would a clinic? Oh, good question. Uh, it's really going to vary. Um, they can have as many. I mean, some, um, sometimes you'll have physicians who are what's called a hospitalist. Um, so let's say you have an outside psychiatrist who does not admit patients to the inpatient unit. They'll send, they'll have a colleague who does all his admissions. So they could have many, many. Some may just have a few. There's no rules on that. On how many patients a physician Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that when they're released, they have like a plan, kind of like a plan of action. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the readmissions rate is, like people who are admitted to inpatient, either voluntary or involuntarily? And it's probably different. There are the, those are available, but they're hospital to hospital, unit to unit. Okay. How often do you see people who are admitted involuntarily go through a lease and refuse to take medicine while they're on the unit and go through the lease hearing and be released? You mean they win the lease hearing? Mm -hmm. um, rarely. Why would that happen? Um, because usually the patient is pretty sick. Lease hearings are not easily done. No, no, why would they get released? Oh, I'm saying rarely. They would rarely be released. But in the case where they do, why would that happen? Because they're not accepting anything the hospital has to offer. There's nothing then that we, there's no. I mean, but they somehow succeeded in convincing. Then so. they may be okay to go out and take care of themselves. Now you're saying all of a sudden end up back in there after another week or two or something? Mm -hmm. No? No. I mean, Just that they would if, they were, if they were admitted uh, They're admitted involuntarily. They go through the 72-hour hold. They're put on the 14-day hold. Mm -hmm. They have the Reese hearing. Mm -hmm. and they well, the Reese hearing is only for refusing to take medication. Right. right. Okay. That, that whole period of time, mm -hmm. they refuse to take medicine. Mm -hmm. Well, we try to do the Reese hearing earlier. We try to do it within those 17 days because we want the patient to benefit from the medication. So we'll try to do that. Uh, it usually happens quickly. We'd like it to. Yeah. Um, well, nurses are very good at working with the patients for the most part. Um, oftentimes the patient kind of understands that they have to take it, or we may have to inject them with it. Mm. We don't like to do that. And, do and actually, oftentimes, we'll give the patient the choice. So if it was me, I'd say, okay, <laughs> I'll take it that way rather than the other way. Yeah. Unless there's a, an adverse, maybe, effect from it, and you don't want to take it for that reason, but something else happens with that medication. Well, I'd like to think that we're not going to give you medication that you tell us you've had an adverse reaction to. If you tell us you've had an adverse reaction to a medication, we're going to give you a different medication. I mean, there's a lot of, there's different classes, different categories. Um, you know, if you walk in and you tell us that you had a terrible reaction to Cyprexa, that's not going to be the medication we're going to give you. Right. You know, we're going to look for something else, and we do have others that we'll give you. I feel like the two of you weren't satisfied with that. Well, it's just, you know, we just went through that. Did you? And, and you managed to convince them that we He's didn't very need the medicine. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, there is that. Yeah. There is very that. Right. Yeah, there is that. Sometimes we know, but there's nothing we can do because at the, that point, it's not the staff. Right. Yeah, the staff are also presenting the same thing, but it's in the hands of the court. Right. So I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we may have to have another failure and another right. time. It's, it's very hard. I'm sure it's harder for the families, but it touches, it touches me as well. I understand that. Okay, I hope you never see you on any patient unit. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sure.